Hey everyone, welcome to Disrupting the Real Estate Hegemony Show. I'm your host, Matt Marsh. And I recently sat down with Josh Crowell. He's a VP with Grandbridge Capital. They're a commercial real estate financing company. And we talked a little bit about interest rates, what the future holds, how lenders are underwriting projects moving forward, and ultimately what lenders are looking for in project sponsors, especially for investors and junior developers, and how investors and developers can better navigate conversations with financing sources to ultimately get better terms and finance more deals. I look forward to bringing you this conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, Josh, excited to have you here, man. So uh, yeah, tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, no, happy to happy to be here, Matt. Um, so, yeah, I uh, live here in Durham, North Carolina. Work in Raleigh, North Carolina, native. Um, I've spent all of my career in the the commercial banking space, um, mostly in uh, at BB&T and then now Truist, and then uh, recently moved over to a company called Grambridge Real Estate Capital. So most of what I do professionally is in commercial real estate finance. Um, which, you know, I think is going to be the bulk of our discussion today is just talking around kind of some of the financing as aspects of commercial real estate development and commercial real estate projects. And then personally do a little bit of investing as well and, and happy to talk about some of that, uh, just some single family rental type stuff, duplex and planning a development project, a small one over in Durham. So happy to discuss any of those, but glad to be here. Yeah, so one of the things that I um, kind of kind of focus on when I when I bring people on the podcast or when I interview them or have discussions with them is I like people who take kind of a unique approach to the real estate industry or they have a little bit of a different perspective. And uh, I mean, this is not meant to be offensive to the industry, but you know, it's I mean, it's like real estate brokers. I mean, how do how do bankers differentiate themselves? You know what I mean? It's it's. You can go to one banker, you can go to another banker, and it's almost like they're offering similar services. So what I appreciated about you, at least the conversations we've had and, and as we've discussed, is you take a little bit of a different approach and, and kind of have a different outlook on the industry. So I do appreciate that. Um, but let me ask you, I mean, was there, was there a reason you got into banking and finance as opposed to kind of a, a, a different industry where you just, you know, were you fascinated by the numbers? You know, what, I mean, what was it? I wish I had a really good story here. Um, you know, so I was an accounting major in undergrad and was on the full course to go an extra year, sit for the CPA exam and become a, a, a boring old accountant. Thank God you um, didn't no do that. I always did the same thing. out there. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got a dad that's a CPA. Um, he's also an attorney. And, you know, I mean, that just seemed to be the course that mm -hmm. was set out uh, for me. But then... You know, I grew up in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So the back door of, of BB&T, uh, their headquarters were there my whole upbringing. I mean, they were founded in Wilson, North Carolina, but they were in Winston-Salem. So I had some good friends growing up whose, whose dads worked for the bank. They seemed to like what they do. They seemed to have a good work-life balance. Um, and so when I was uh, looking at career paths after college, you know, I, I did a little bit of interviewing at the bank and had a job offer in one hand and then a uh, extra year of school and sitting for the CPA exam on the other hand and decided that I would rather just go ahead and start in the working world. So okay. that's how it kind of worked out is just um, started at the bank. And then I think during that, you know, it's almost like something that you start doing, you then grow a passion for rather than having a passion for something and then to try to start doing it. And I just kind of started uh, being a little bit more passionate about finance um, and then particularly passionate about real estate. Um, so pairing those th two things together, um, the finance end and the real estate finance and the real estate piece kind of kind of led me to where I am today. Okay. Makes sense. Well, so I think I'm going to frame and, and, and for those listening and for the audience, I'm going to frame this discussion through a couple of different lenses. So I'm a I'm a real estate developer. So so for me, you know, I'll I'll be asking personally and for for other real estate developers out there, um, kind of what's what's you know what's changing in the industry, what you look for as far as project sponsors and and things from that lens. But I think it's also important to kind of touch on, 
you know, what's happening to small business owners and small businesses that are looking to expand and what that means for their acquisition or ground up project financing and then investors as well. So um, I guess that 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 leads to, to kind of the elephant in the room, because, I mean, right now we're sitting June 2nd. Um, interest rates have been going up for, uh, I mean, pretty, pretty steadily for we're going on, what, three, four months now, mortgage rates, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, so, I mean, talk a little bit about that as far as, you know, what's happening to obviously the Federal Reserve, we can talk a little bit high level, Federal Reserve, Fed funds rate, what that means for the monetary system a little bit, how the, the, the 10 year, you know, treasury yield is kind of used as a benchmark and, 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 and how, what exactly is happening to interest rates and what does that mean for real estate? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a good question and a deep talk. Topic. I know it's loaded. I'm um, happy to dig. Yeah, no, happy to dig into it. And, you know, I mean, it, it's funny, you know, I mean, I, I studied interest rates in college and studied kind of the history of, of different environments that we've been in. And, and then my whole career has been spent in a very low interest rate environment, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit different for lenders, a little bit different for borrowers. Um, just the approach to projects, the approach to finance. Um, changes in those environments and you know I've, I've i've my career i've lived through one stage where i felt like interest rates were doing what they are today in 2018 where they started to to increase a little bit the fed had made a few decisions to hike interest rates and you know we thought that uh they were going to continue to increase and then there were some decisions made um where that did not happen and they went back down to to kind of zero and and it's been that way and was that way through the pandemic and now we're in a place where we've got inflation, we've got some other macroeconomic trends, um, and interest rates are a heavy topic of conversation. So I think just to keep it high level, maybe for some listeners and just some of the basics of how a commercial bank or another lender might price a loan or what they might use, you mentioned the U.S. Treasury, you mentioned the federal funds rate, and I think a lot of people don't understand how that feeds into their everyday Main Street bank, where they walk in and try to get a loan, and how those huge kind of uh, market trends change what happens to their business. Mm -hmm. um, so really the ways the, that different institutions price, and especially, you know, talking about kind of the banking sector, which I think is probably where most of your clients go for for capital and for loans. I mean, you know, you're looking at kind of floating rate debt or fixed rate debt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that Fed's fund rate, whenever the Fed makes a decision to increase that, it directly um, impacts what the prime rate is, mm -hmm. which is something that for those that don't know, it's, it's, it's published in the Wall Street Journal. It's what banks tend to lend to clients in retail environments. You might see a a HELOC be based on a, a prime rate plus a or minus a credit spread. Um, so that's going to directly impact that rate. So if you've got a home equity line on your house and you've got a prime rate at say prime plus zero, that's 4% today. If they make a decision next month to increase rates by half a percent, that rate's going to immediately be four and a half percent based on that decision. Mm -hmm. um, but in the commercial world, we see a lot of loans priced off of the U.S. Treasury, which is just pretty much what the market considers a risk-free interest rate. So mm -hmm. when you look at a 10-year Treasury, whatever the yield is on that bond, so a buyer buys that bond with a certain coupon on it, and then that translates to a yield based on the price that they pay. Um, you know, that's, that's considered, if you want 10-year debt, that's a risk-free rate. So a lender is going to look at that and say, well, well, we'll give you that rate plus a credit spread based on the risk of the deal. So in my world today, where we work a lot with life insurance companies, the CMBS market, um, which is kind of the commercial mortgage based securities to get traded on Wall Street and all that kind of stuff, we use treasury rates as a benchmark. So as those increase, our rates are going to increase as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then those credit spreads that a lender might be putting on top of that, you know, those can go up and down based on risk in the market as well. So when you've got war happening, 
um, when you've got other macroeconomic trends, inflation, things, stuff, stuff like that, um, creditors are going to want a better return on their money. So they're going to increase their credit spread as well. So you add those two together and you get kind of your interest rate. So that helps. I mean, that's, that's, that's a little scratch at the surface, um, but maybe that's some, something you've got some thoughts on as well that we could dig into further. No, I mean, that's good insight. And I guess it kind of leads me to, to my next question. So obviously, rates are going up. Um, I mean, are, are, are you seeing um, spreads increase because of the uncertainty in the, 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 the kind of macro economy in addition to rates rising? And, and, and is that ultimately being passed to the, to the end user, to the consumer, to the small business owner, or to the investor that's looking to, to, to finance a project? Yes. And, you know, my, my space is mostly in the commercial real estate lending world. Yeah. And a lot of that increase in rates, both on the market increasing rates and then credit spreads increasing as well, is going to be highly dependent on the asset, asset type, the risk profile and the deal, mm -hmm. along with kind of what's happening on a macro perspective. Um, so I think we're going to dig into a little bit of that, of how we underwrite and how we look at uh, risk in deals. Um, but yes, I mean, a higher leverage deal versus a lower leverage deal, it, you know, it's going to impact what kind of rate an end user gets in the market. Um, and, you know, an, another thing that's going to impact too is the amount that you can borrow. You know, yeah. as, as, as you know, in commercial real estate, you know, there's an income component there. And a lender is going to look at that income to how they're going to repay the debt, the interest, and the principal on that. And as interest rates go up, payments go up. So loan amounts go down. So, I mean, it's kind of simple math at, at right. that point. So as, as, as rates increase, just the amount of money you can borrow on a project is going to go down. Just because the amount of monthly payment you can make, it's going to go down. Mm -hmm. So now. Um... And without speculating too much, obviously the Fed has announced the fact that they are 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 trying to raise the Fed funds rate to two percent, I believe, by the end of 2022. Um, so obviously that's 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 the anticipated plan. I mean, what do you see the next 18 to? And I'm not going to hold you to this because everyone out there can can can, you know, postulate and, and everyone's got their own opinion on it. But I mean, what do you see over the next 18 to 24 months? Because I, as I have, um, you know, uh, business owners coming to me or saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm expanding. Um, I need to either make a decision now that we're going ground up or we're doing something, you know, we're going to acquire a building. When's the right time to do it? Um, so what are the, what are the next 18 to kind of 24 months look like from an interest rate perspective? Yeah, that's a that's another good question, and you know I've, I've got a love hate relationship with the, that question. Obviously, I'm in the industry and get asked that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And if I if I knew a definite answer for it, um, you know there there are lots of ways to to make oh, money get a on that information. Business. But yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but you know, I think what your clients need to do and what borrowers need to do is you know that's just interest rate risk is another risk in the deal. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a rising interest rate environment like we are today, you need to price that risk in. And lenders are going to do that. And borrowers need to do that as well. When you're looking at a project, when you're thinking about expanding, when you're thinking about borrowing money, when you've got a construction project that's a floating rate debt that you're not going to be able to lock in or complete until two years from now, you need to consider that. I mean, you need to take interest rates are as they are today. And you need to price in where they could be in two years and see if the project still works. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's my advice. I mean, you know, banks and lenders are typically going to stress interest rates in their underwriting. So if, if that interest rate, you know, even if you're locking in a 4% interest rate today, you know, they might underwrite it at 5%. Um, they might underwrite it at 5.5%, just depending on the type of environment that we're in. Um, just to make sure that, you know, even if that's a five-year fixed rate deal, you don't want to be refinancing that in five years, 2% higher than you are today. 
Um, so, I mean, I think it's just another risk to take into the equation and it's another thing to mitigate. So it's just something to be thinking about and making sure that you're pricing into a model um, based on whatever the specifics of that deal might be. So, I mean, that that's what I would say. I mean, nobody knows. I mean, the market seems to expect interest rates are going to be higher um, by the end of the year and probably plateau and be higher in 2023 and probably 2024. Mm-hmm. Um, so move move kind of up and then flatten out a little bit, but at a higher interest rate than we've seen in a long time. So just, you know, make sure that if, if, if you're a borrower in that scenario, um, you are looking, you're being forward thinking, you're looking out at that risk. And if you've got a refinance coming up in the next two to three years from a lower interest rate to a higher interest rate, make sure the numbers pencil. If you're coming out of a construction project or taking on a construction project, make sure that you're penciling in a higher interest rate, potentially a higher cap rate, you know, all of those things into the equation to make sure that you're not just underwriting or looking at a deal or an expansion opportunity today. What does that look like in two years? What does that look like in three years? And does it still make sense? And I mean, that's, that's what I would encourage people to do. No, I mean, that's good insight. And I appreciate you touching on underwriting because that's 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 kind of the next question I, I I wanted to pose. So I'm I am I'm a little bit jaded because in 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 the social circles I I I run in, you know, I hang out with some of these multifamily syndicators who are always talking about the fact that they're, you know, conservative underwriting, blah, blah, blah. And it's it's I, I never know what that means. I mean, are you, you know, what what sort of vacancy assumptions are you using? What what interest rates are you you know, are you assuming, are you assuming a refinance in two to three years at the same rate? Exactly. Things that you were touching on. So I have no idea what that means, but how is, how, how, how is underwriting changing and is the industry catching up? So obviously, you know, banks are underwriting projects based on higher interest rates, but are you still seeing investors coming in with, 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 you know, kind of outlandish expectations and, and are you having to be the bad guy saying, Look, I mean, you guys, you guys haven't priced interest rate risk into this into this deal. Um, so, I mean, how how you know touch touch a little bit on interest rates, but 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 how are banks underwriting deals a little bit differently in this environment? Yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of the underwriting, as far as just kind of the nuts and bolts, looks very similar okay. to to how it would anytime, just as far as kind of the assumptions that. A lender might make, but you know, I mean, I, you know, we work with a lot of lenders. I mean, we're a Cram, at Cranbridge, we're a mortgage banking company, so I mean, we're not a direct lender ourselves, but we work with lenders kind of across the spectrum. So we're working um, with agencies, the CMBS market, we're working with life insurance companies, we're working with commercial banks, and I mean, they're all different in the way that they look at those things. But I mean, to answer kind of that specific question around interest rates, is you know. You know, we were working on a deal recently where we had a bank term sheet. Um, we ended up taking it to some, some to some local banks, and it was a pretty sizable office portfolio. Um, and you know, they were underwriting. I think at the time, maybe at a a five percent uh, stressed interest rate, even though they were offering a four percent rate. And this was you know this was several months ago. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that deal was moving a little slowly. And, you know, if, if if the borrower didn't move fast enough, the bank had made an internal policy decision to increase their stressed interest rate to 5.75%, just based yeah. on where the market was headed. So automatically, if you plug that into the equation of how they're getting to how much loan they'll lend, you know, maybe you fall short by a few million dollars of where your loan was. You know, maybe, you know, a $60 million project that they were going to lend is now $58 million. And, you know, the, the borrower is going to have to come up with additional equity based on increased interest rates. So, I mean, I think that's kind of the direct correlation with bank and interest rate that they're underwriting. Um, and then, I mean, obviously, there's lots of other uh, assumptions that go into that. Um, which we we can talk about, but I mean the the market typically dictates that, and I would say besides interest rates, the market's also going to dictate kind of some vacancy underwriting analysis, and then also where are rent's going to be um, in a rising interest rate environment. Um, is that going to slow down rent growth? And somebody that's pro pro-form, forming 
a, a certain rent per unit on a multifamily project, is that going to be a, is that going to be pulled down some by increased interest rates, slowing inflation, um, and other market dynamics? So, what um, what when 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 an investor or a developer comes to you and they say, hey, you know, I got this proposed project, I've underwritten it. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've made these assumptions. What are you looking for in a project sponsor? And, and, and we can kind of start from the, from the traditional um, existing acquisition investor perspective Then I do want to touch on the, on the perspective of, of, of a developer. What are you looking for in a project sponsor when they're coming to you and saying, you know, I need some cash for this project? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk a lot, I think, about kind of the deal by deal underwriting. Yeah. But I mean, that question is the first question that any bank is going to ask. It's like, who are you? And what experience do you have? Mm -hmm. And I think from a sponsor perspective, any lender is looking for first and foremost experience. Have you done this before? Um, especially on the development piece. Um, but then also even just buying a stabilized property that already has rents in place. It's like, are you going to be able to manage that asset? Are you going to be able to manage any tenant turnover? Are you going to be able to manage any increased in op increased operating expenses? Are you going to be able to manage any sort of, you know, who knows what might happen to the property during your ownership? And are you going to be able to do that? I mean, you know, I think of it as, as kind of like if you're, if you're going to a mechanic with your car and you go to two mechanics and one of them says, ah, I've fixed this a hundred times. And one says, ah, I've never done this before. Mm -hmm. And they both give you a quote, which quote do you trust? You know, yeah. it's mm -hmm. like, you're going to trust the guy that's done a hundred times. Um, so I would say first and foremost, looking to that experience piece and just a track record of successful projects. Um, and then second in a sponsor. And then again, apart from the deal is, what is that sponsor's financial profile? Um, and particularly around net worth, liquidity, do they have, based on the size of the project, obviously smaller projects take a smaller net worth and a smaller liquidity to be able to complete and execute on and acquire and all that kind of stuff. Um, the larger the project goes, the larger those numbers need to be. And there's no exact ratio, I think, um, Borrowers often want want that from a bank. They want you to say, well, how, what do I need to look like? What do I need? And it's just, you know, it's 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 more art than science of understanding what fits. And it's just, you know, a bank being able to look at that individual and trust them. I mean, when a bank is coming in and say they're lending you 60, 70, 80% of a project, they're the largest partner in that deal. Yeah. I mean, they've got the most capital at risk. And they want to make sure that they've got somebody behind that project that's going to be successful and has the, I mean, they've got, they want to and has the way to deal with anything that might come up. If a property doesn't lease up, if you lose a tenant, if there's some damage, if there's, um, you know, any sort of thing that might happen that requires a financial fix or an expertise fix, that that sponsor can handle that. So, I mean, that's, I mean, honestly, that's the most, that's, the most important, um, most important factor in kind of getting a deal done and getting a bank behind a deal. And, you know, those, I think of those two things as levers, right? As, you know, experience goes down and financial wherewithal goes up, you know, you can kind of take over not being experienced if, you know, you've got a lot of financial backing. And the same, if you've got a lot of experience, you know, maybe you don't need as much financial backing. Those two can kind of move um you know inverse of each other to get a deal done but yeah, yeah certainly those two things experience and kind of their their personal balance sheet now are those outside of the interest rate discussion are those benchmarks or are those parameters changing with some of the mounting uncertainty in the 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 macro economy and i mean are you are you looking at you know um even if a deal pencils and a developer who came to you 24 months ago with a project, are, are you not necessarily 
underwriting that project the same way? Are you looking, you know, are, 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 are you looking for more experience out of these operators just because the, the, the landscape's changing a little bit and there are so many uncertainties out there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously lenders vary in their risk appetite. They vary on the projects they want to do. But I mean, in times of uncertainty like this, and especially when you're talking about developers, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about construction, you know, there, there are times when banks will say, hey, we're only doing construction for existing clients. You know, we're only doing construction for clients that are already good clients. We've already done projects with, and then we'll take on a new project. We're not going to do it for a prospect. We're not going to do it for a potential client. Um, just because, you know, having, I mean, having that relationship and being familiar with a borrower is extremely important to a lender. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, to answer your question directly, I mean, yes. And in environments like this, you know, it's, it's, it's particularly important. I mean, I think for borrowers to have loyalty to banks and then, you know, banks to have loyalty back of being able to do projects that maybe they wouldn't do um, for someone that they don't have a history with. Makes sense. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit and kind of get into the, I think one of the things that people have a little bit of a hang up or kind of, kind of some, some, some trepidation with is, is how do you, how do you approach a bank? How do you, how does a borrower, or how does an operator navigate that conversation? Because, you know, I mean, a, 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 a bank, you know, in, 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 in some perspectives, you're sitting across the desk from someone and, you know, they're, they're holding the, they're the ones with the deep pockets. They're the ones who are kind of holding the, 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 you know, the future of that project in their hands on the other side of the, you know, the other side of the coin, a bank is, or a lender is no more than, you know, a, a salesman themselves because they need to get money out the door into projects that, you know, make sense or, 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 or you know, that are going to make the bank money. So, so, so how does a, how does a, a, a borrower navigate that conversation? I mean, how do they paint the picture? What, what, what sorts of things do you suggest or do you look for when you're sitting on the other side of the table and someone comes to you with a project? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Banks are large. <laughs> I mean, especially, you know, you know, you know the big ones are, are really large and it's hard to navigate. And, I, you know, I think the first thing that a borrower needs to do is find the right person at the bank to talk to. I mean, you would be surprised. I mean, I had a, a discussion about a, a, a large hotel purchase just this week and financing it that walked into a branch. I mean, you're really? talking a, six, a $60 million, yeah, hotel purchase. And I mean, that still happens. I mean, that still happens where they're, they're in the branch, they're doing some personal banking and they say, um, you know, hey, we're, we've got this project and, you know, do you have anybody that would do it? And then, you know, you just hope that the, the banker is trained to then call the right person and get the right person involved. And in this case, you know, they called a, a, a commercial banker who then called me, mm -hmm. um, you know, on, on, on the side that does, you know, larger commercial real estate projects. Um, so a find the right person. And a lot of people do that through word of mouth. They do that through their friends. They talk to them and ask who their banker is and get their contact information that way. And then uh, second, I would say, you know, make sure that you have kind of all your ducks in a row before you go talk to the bank. I mean, a lot of times, you know, and you, you, once you've done a couple projects, you build relationships with banks where, and a banker where you can kind of start talking to them with kind of a half-baked idea prior to being ready to move forward with it. And once you've kind of got a relationship banker, you've got a banker to call on, you've got somebody to talk to, you can do some more of that. But when it's your first project and you're talking to a bank for the first time, um, just make sure that you've, you've got the project kind of fully fleshed out and that you've got kind of everything ready to go. I mean, I think, you know, more when I was in the commercial banking world than now, but it's like you would see borrowers come in and they don't have a pro forma uh, drawn out, maybe don't have a fully fleshed out budget. Um, for a project and uh, just make sure that it makes sense and make sure that you sell the bank, not sell the banker, but explain to the banker why it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you work with a lot of different businesses in a lot of, a lot of different industries. Um, and, you know, same with bankers. 
owners. They see a lot of different businesses and a lot of different industries. And a lot of times you just have to educate them on why it's a good business decision. Because what a lot of borrowers don't realize is that a banker, like you said, is a sales guy as well. I mean, they've got to get out loans. They've got to go sell that deal to somebody inside the bank who actually mm-hmm. approves it. Um, you know, I wasn't approving deals myself. I'm still not approving deals myself. Um, so I've got to go take that deal to somebody internally in the bank who's actually got the, the pin to sign off on it and say, we approve this and we're good to fund this project. So, I mean, you just got to give them that ammunition and the business, why it makes sense and not just put something on their desk and say, Hey, I need $2 million. You know, they got to know why, why it makes sense for your business, how it's going to be repaid, all those types of things. Just make sure that you've got those questions answered um, before addressing that and give the banker what they need so that they can win that internal battle. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's something done. you don't often think about is the fact that the banker who's sitting across the table from you, they're not the ones who are approving the loan. Exactly. They need to go to someone the you know, the chief credit officer in the bank, um, who, who, who's the one who's 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 actually, you know, um, given their stamp of approval on these things. And, and, and you're right. So it's it's there are a couple of, of levels or echelons of of. Um, that these that these projects need to kind of uh, levels of approval that these projects need to move through and 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 it needs to be sold or pitched um, kind of along the way and I don't I, I think that's something that most junior or novice investors a lot of business owners don't consider it's the one that's sitting across the table from you it's not the one that's actually putting that stamp of approval on the project so. yeah and a good banker is going to know how to help you. You know, navigate that process. And, you know, I always tell people, it's like the bank is not always as important as the banker. Mm. You you can have two different, two different bankers at the same institution that are getting that one would get the deal done. One wouldn't. Um, So it's important to have somebody that, that knows what they're doing, knows how to navigate the bank, um, knows how to make the deal on the front end, something that the bank likes on the back end. Um, and just make sure to present it um, what the, the way the bank wants to see it. I mean, sometimes just, you know, the first light that you get on a deal can sometimes soil it. And you want to make sure that you're just highlighting the risks as a banker, but then also why those make sense and mitigating those risks. I mean, that's the banking 101 is identify risks and mitigate risks. So. So um want to talk a little bit about the equity side of the piece because I kind of want to um, segue into the, the the overall capital stack. Um, what are you seeing and 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 you might not uh, have a ton of insight into this, but what are you seeing on the the the, the equity side of the house? Um, is is are certain tranches of equity? getting more risk averse? Are they diverting funds from real estate into other asset classes? Or are they diverting more funds into real estate? Are you still seeing you know, equity sources that are, that are chasing these deals as vigorously as they were 12 and 24 months ago? Because the way I look at it is, you, know, you got a, a, a world of investment vehicles out there. Um, you got a world of places where, where equity can park their money. And real estate is, is, is one of those asset classes that's traditionally a little bit um, resistant to macroeconomic fluctuations, a little bit more than kind of equities markets, a little bit more than the bond market. And you're seeing kind of an emergence of the crypto space, but you're seeing a ton of volatility in that. And so, so real estate historically has been seen as, as, as kind of a safe asset to park cash, especially when you know, the, the value of cash is eroding at seven or 8% year over year. And, and I have no idea what, what May's numbers are going to look like as far as inflation, but anyway, so kind of a long winded, uh, <laughs> long winded question, but what are you seeing on the equity side of the house? Yeah. I mean, we, we're not as exposed to that. I mean, we, we see some equity just in some of the companies that we work with, especially on the life insurance side and, you know, working with debt funds is, they usually have kind of MES or PREF equity 
that they'll also put into deals <clears throat> just to kind of complete that 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 capital stack. And you know, as as cap rates decrease, interest rates increase, like we talked about, and you know, I mean, your senior debt, so what a lender is putting on a property is lower on the basis of the whole. So maybe 55, 60 percent, whatever it is, there's a larger gap in the capital stack. So we're seeing more lenders, I think, pursuing MES programs, PREF equity programs. And then I think when you think of just institutional equity, there's still demand there. I mean, just from what, what, what we've seen, I think, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's chasing yield. <clears throat> and, you know, everybody's chasing a return and, and wants that to outperform what other asset types are doing. <clears throat> and as you see kind of the, what the equity markets has done over the you know, the past six months this year, um, and then kind of money leaving kind of the VC space, um, and, you know, maybe a little bit of private equity, you know, I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of that flow into the real estate market still, I and mean, we're still seeing strong support for, for low cap rates, even at increased interest rates. I mean, it seems like the demand is, is, is still there, but again, I mean, I, I, that's not the space that I play in as much. Most of that's just kind of probably market commentary and just just a general feel for where the market's at. And it seems like the demand's still there. I mean, we seem, seem to see lenders still rolling out more and pitching more PREF equity programs, more MES debt programs, which are higher yielding and, and help a borrower kind of fill out uh, all the capital that they need for a project. Yeah, and you, you you started to kind of answer my next question a little bit. I'm going to kind of put you on the spot, but it's about creative ways to kind of round out that capital stack because it's it's you know it's a it's it's a huge challenge as far as when 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 I think about projects as a real estate developer, I think all right, well you know I got a a, a, a project that's going to cost you know 100 percent of the, the 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 cost of the project. So how am I going to you know round out that capital stack? I got to I got a, a tranche or a sliver of that that's going to be debt. A portion of that is going to be sponsor equity. Um, and I think typically, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, uh, uh, you're probably going to want to see at least 5% of, of, of a project being financed via sponsor equity. And then how do you, how do you round out that equity portion? I mean, do you have, do you have any other ideas as far as creative ways that, that, folks can 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 try to finance some of these projects without you know having to sell their soul to 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 someone for you know hard money or or mm -hmm. or something that's a little bit more expensive like like mez yeah no i mean obviously the like you said i mean the simplest and probably most familiar people are is just with sponsor buys buys a property they put in their equity the bank fills out the rest with the senior yeah. loan and and that's it um, but I mean, there's lots of different ways to finance a project and we see lots of people finance projects in, in, in different ways. And whether that's kind of the use of that, that senior debt and then a MES piece and then a PREF piece, and then, you know, your sponsor or your limited partner equity, and then your sponsor equity, or, you know, I mean, we, we see a lot of people, um, you know, I'd probably say the most creative thing that we see besides kind of what I just laid out is, you know, use of, uh, tax credits for yeah. um, a project as equity. So you've got a historical building, you're going in and, and, and renovating it, and you've got some historic tax credits um, that you've got an investor that'll come in, they'll bridge that until the project's complete. So they'll give you a bridge loan in there as part of the capital stack. And then once those tax credits are available, they purchase those. So those go into the project as equity um, once, it's, once it's all done. So, I mean, I would say that's what we're seeing. I mean, you know, again, just with increased interest rates and still low cap rates, I think, you know, we're seeing more borrowers get comfortable with MES. Mm -hmm. um, and then some senior lenders don't want to see MES come into a deal and won't allow MES to come into the deal. So a lot of people that provide MES debt will also provide it as PREF equity, um, just because it looks a little bit different. They have a different claim um, if something were to happen. but um, yeah, I mean, I would say that's probably the, the, the most creative that, that we see. Okay. I haven't seen anybody using, you mentioned crypto. I haven't seen anybody using that to uh, fund a project at this point in time. Man, it's coming. It's coming. Once, <laughs> once, 
once real estate is 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 kind of fully adopted on the blockchain and 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 once tokenization becomes you know uh, yeah more widely I did, adopted I, I will let you know actually I, I i did we did see one project that was uh crowdfunded um which is kind of similar to that where you know they essentially did you know imagine your uh um gosh was a kickstarter type campaign and went to kind of the local community for a project and pitched it and i mean you've got you know a hundred people at anywhere from a hundred you know five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars piece type putting in in equity into a crowdfund um situation and there's you know i i had to learn a lot about it during that process i i had never seen that before and i mean there there are uh you know companies out there and talking about kind of disruptor I mean, there's companies out there that that run this and you know they're regulated by the sec and they do all the kind of sec filings as far as that crowdfunding is concerned and then, i mean that's that's interesting and it allows somebody to maybe get in a project in their backyard at you know a hundred dollar investment a five hundred dollar investment a thousand dollar investment rather than when you traditionally think of institutional investors who are cutting checks for projects you know hundred thousand dollars and up type mm -hmm. scenarios so yeah. that was that was a little different yeah yeah no i mean it's actually funny you mentioned that i had a conversation with a guy and I'll, I'll i'll give him a shout out but it's a it's a group full of capital out of out of wilmington and they do exactly that so they're 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 crowdfunding projects or they're helping sponsors crowdfund projects that are veteran minority or women owned um so it's a little bit of of of, of kind of a niche in that space but Exactly, because the Jobs Act of 2012, which kind of codified that into law, wasn't passed until I think it was 2014. So it is a, a, a relatively kind of new space in the financing world. But you're exactly right. I mean, it allows local individuals who, you know, want to invest their money in, in kind of an alternative vehicle, don't have 50 or $100,000 to, to write a check. They're not an accredited investor. And they, they, you know, that that sponsor goes out to the community. They create community support. They get some buy-in and, and, and that local community can kind of invest in a project in their backyard. So it's, it's yeah. interesting that you saw one of those. And I think it's becoming more and more prevalent as, you know, projects are, they're, they're, they're transitioning a little bit into kind of not necessarily community focused, but I think that more and more investors are looking for kind of a, a, a philosophy behind their investment. And obviously that's existed, but uh, yeah, so they're, they're, it's, it's kind of an interesting space. Um, well, so, you know, I, I appreciate your insight um, and I do, I have one last question to kind of, to kind of round this out. I mean, what, what suggestions, you've answered it, um, a little bit already, but what suggestions do you have for an investor or a business owner that's, that's, that's chasing a commercial property before they come to you, what do you suggest they're doing if they want to, you know, get a project approved and obviously, you know, getting their, getting their ducks in a row. That's great. Kind of, kind of, you know, building a pro forma, developing a little bit of a business plan, but what can people start? That's a question that I've, you know, people come and ask me. Yeah. I, I work in the real estate besides, business. Besides hiring Matt Marsh and working with him. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but because, you know, they come and ask me and they, they because the, the, the real estate industry is this like um, kind of amorphous blob of a bunch of different service providers that, that work in the space, the, the assumption is, well, you know, you got experience in the real estate industry. You must be inside the minds of these lenders. You must know how they think. You must know, you know, what I need to do to prepare for that first conversation. So what's, what's kind of your best suggestion before someone comes to you? How can someone prepare what they need to prepare to have that first conversation? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if I boiled it down to, to anything, I mean, I think obviously with any real estate investment, with any real estate development it's do as much due diligence as you possibly can yeah. um you know i mean they need to understand it in and out um and, and not just you know we see a lot of investors a lot of developers all they see is the opportunity 
um, and, and don't usually recognize the risks in making an investment like that or the risks in doing a new development project. And, you know, a, a lender is going to see the risks. I mean, they, they, they just are. We're, we're trained pessimists and it's, it's terrible, but uh, we're, we're trained to, to see all the risks and all the things that could go wrong. So just make sure that they're going in eyes wide open and that they see all those as well. And they, they've got reasons for why the project still makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, I think if you, if you go into a conversation with a lender as it's all rosy and everything's going to be great and this is why this project is, is amazing and, you know, there are no downsides to this, I mean, that's, that, that can sometimes be a red flag when it's like, you know, you're not even recognizing the things that could happen or, or why this project might not make sense. Um, so just make sure that you've got a full scope I mean, you've looked at the project from every different angle that you can look at it from. Uh, you've identified the opportunity, identified the risk. You know, it's kind of like that business plan. Walk through that, that you mentioned. You know, do a SWOT analysis or, you know, all that kind of stuff that, that you do in business school. You do that stuff and make sure that, that you understand it really well and then have that conversation. Got it. So. Well, yeah. so I'm going to give you a, uh, an opportunity to, to kind of give your plugs, but what... Uh... So obviously you work for Grambridge, your 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 local to the Raleigh area. What what sorts of clients are are you know would benefit from from your services? What sorts of clients are you enjoy working with? What sorts of projects do you like that you know kind of get you excited? Yeah, no, I mean I I I say that I'm a deal junkie. I love projects. I love looking at projects. I, I love working with uh, uh, borrowers. And I, I mean, I think where, the way that I want to position myself is, you know, you asked a lot of questions of what advice would you give um, to different borrowers? And it's like, I, I, I see myself as wanting to be an advisor and an advocate where, you know, clients are coming to me and they're using me um, because I'm providing them not just a loan on a property, you know, not just equity for a property, uh, purchase, but that I'm, I'm actually kind of almost a, a member of the team, almost like a CFO of, of some sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like, I'm working through it from, you know, the time that they've kind of got that their eye on that property to, to when it gets financed and, and helping them through that. So, I mean, what we typically work on from kind of a project perspective is stabilized assets. I mean, I, I love developers. I would love to work with more developers, um, love to look at commercial lending. I mean, we we work as a broker in that capacity where, I mean, most of the time we're probably going to, to banks rather than some of our relationships that we have uh, with life insurance companies and um, agencies and, and those types of lenders just because they don't have construction programs. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'd say, you know, I mean, for us, you know, the best project is a stabilized asset um, that's got income on it where they, they, the borrower wants, you know, to, to recapitalize it, cash out, get a long-term fixed rate. I mean, we, we've been working on a project, uh, and it's going to be a 20 year fixed rate with a life insurance company on a multifamily project. So, I mean, and then anything, anything kind of in that multifamily world, we've got a, a, a Fannie Mae, a Freddie Mac, and a HUD license. So we're a direct lender for those. So, um, you know, those make a lot of sense when you've got a multifamily project that's, you know, a, a million dollars of debt and up um, is where they can play. And, and, th and those loans make a lot of sense. And they look, when you talk about underwriting, they look different than bank finance and have some different tools um, in the tool chest to, to lend you know, maybe more dollars or a longer amortization or longer fixed rate than, than a bank would. Yeah. So, so well, yeah, any, those types of projects, happy to, to take a look at them and advise and, and see how we can help. And do you only work on projects here locally? Do you look at projects elsewhere? Um, yeah. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Good question. So we are uh, nationwide. So we've got 29 offices, I believe, across the United States. Um, our lenders lend nationwide as well. I mean, like I said, sometimes we, we, we have a good relationship with local regional banks here in Raleigh, Durham, Triangle area in Eastern North Carolina. But I mean, our, the lenders that we work with the most are national scale. Mm -hmm. So we do projects nationwide. Um, you know, I've 
I've, I've talked to, to borrowers in California and New York and, and different places. The core of what we do is going to be here in the triangle. So, so borrowers that are here, even though they might have assets that are around the country, but you know, I mean, we've got, like I said, offices across the country. So, I mean, we can, we've got market insight and people on the ground, you know, anywhere that, that, you know, you might, you might have somebody come to you from. So we've got resources across the country. That's good. Um, can people, uh, you on LinkedIn, can people follow you anywhere? Kind of, kind of stay up to date and, uh, connect with you. Yeah. LinkedIn. I don't know how you do that. LinkedIn, uh, Josh Crowell on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'll put it up somewhere. I just want okay. to, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, you can reach to... Josh. Yeah, Josh.crowell at grandbridge.com. And you can look the grandbridge.com website. You know, you can sort by people, look at Raleigh, and I'm right there with all my contact information. Cool. All right. Well, this has been, uh, I appreciate the insight. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's even, you know, it's good for me to have these conversations every, every six or 12 months with, with lenders just to get a better idea of the, the, Kind of the landscape outside of a specific deal, just the, the overall landscape, how the how the industry is changing, how deal underwriting is changing, how you guys are looking at deals differently, how you're kind of analyzing and pricing and assessing some of the risk that even we can't quantify right now. Um, you know how 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 is that impacting deals and deal flow? So I appreciate the. Uh, Appreciate your time. Appreciate the insight. And it was, uh, yeah, it's nice to chat. Yeah, absolutely. I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm sure we could have gotten uh, even further down in the weeds if we wanted to. That's all right. I mean, I, I, as much as I enjoy that, I don't know if everyone else will. So <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Yep.